What if I tell you that the solution to food security is to simply listen to your plants? Imagine you're walking down the street. You hear all sorts of sound and voices. There are people chatting. There's someone on the phone. There are friends catching up over a coffee. But wait a minute. There's someone else talking, but you can't hear them. Don't worry, nor panic. It's not a ghost, nor that it's some wavelength that your ears can't detect. It's just plants, like us. They're living their lives. They're chatting, shouting, ranting, complaining, but most of all, whispering. My PhD looks at what these plant cells are whispering about and hence, they call me the plant whisperer. But what, in fact, that I actually research on is something called RNA modifications, or, as introduced earlier, the punctuations. And you'll see why later. It is important for us to understand what the plant cells are whispering about. Take us as an example. As you're listening as I speak, you are listening every single word that I have to say. But the conversation doesn't stop here. In your mind and in your heart, you're talking to yourself. What is she saying? Do plant cells whisper? And why do I need to know this? These internal monologues are essential to help us process the information that's coming to us, especially new, unknown information. And similarly, that's what plant cells actually do, and overall help plants to function as an individual. Talking about the language itself, there are actually two systems, uh, sorry. Talking about the language itself, there are actually two components that I would like to introduce to you. First, it's what plants talk to another plant. And on a cellular level, what plant cells talk to each other. And my focus is the later, which is the main focus of my PhD for the past almost four years. Today, I'm going to bring you on a journey, a journey that I've been exploring and growing together with my plants along my PhD. In this journey, I've designed it to have three stops. First, we'll look at plant cell whispers, followed by looking at a couple of plants in distress and how we can help them. Last but not least, looking at how plants race against time. And here we go. Language is an important media of communication. Take English as an example. Words form sentences. Sometimes, for effective communication, a simple sentence is enough. However, under cir certain circumstances, it is important for us to add on punctuation marks, a comma, a full stop, an exclamation mark, to get the right message across. And this is not entirely unique to us. Plants do have the same system as well. But before I go into what kind of system they actually utilize, I'll give you a classic example. Let's eat grammar. Let's eat grammar. It's the same sentence with the same word, but a simple addition and removal of a comma could simply turn a friendly invitation to cannibalism. Yikes, you don't want to eat your grammar. And so back to the concept of sentences and punctuations. In the plant cell world, sentences are known as ribonucleic acids, or to be precise, messenger ribonucleic acids, or mRNAs. On these mRNAs, there are a total of currently identified 150 modifications that can potentially be added onto these messages. Does the word mRNA sound familiar? It's not completely foreign to us because it is exactly the same component that's being used in manufacturing the current COVID-19 vaccine. But that's not all. To get messages across besides the component of sentences and punctuations, you need the mailman. And hence, in the plant cell world, and also in other cellular organisms, we do have 
transfer ribonucleic acids, or known as tRNAs. The tRNAs are like the mailman. They get your letter, they deliver it to the ones that you care the most, or the ones that matter. But to actually help these tRNAs or mailmen get the right message across, they also need the punctuations attached. Hence, the punctuations or RNA modifications are not just solely found on messenger ribonucleic acids or mRNA. They were also found in the messenger itself, tRNAs. And now you must be asking, yes, these are interesting, but when should we know that we should listen to the plant cells? You don't want to listen to gossips, nor you just want to, nor you are interested in their daily life conversation. Catching the message at essential time matters. For example, when your plants are sick or stressed. You don't really want to wait until they stop flowering or your plants wilting. That's when everything's too late. And hence, this brings me to our second stop of our journey, looking at plants in distress. Stress is universal. We've all experienced it in different stages of our life, but it hits us the hardest since last year when COVID-19 appears. And we are still trying to address this challenge day by day. Even though, as um, Sana ex explained earlier, that we are actually doing much better in South Australia. But we are not the only ones who are stressing about how we should keep on striving and living in this pandemic. Plants, on the other hand, are stressed as well. But what are they stressed about? Like us, they don't like being dehydrated. They hate strong lights, and some of them just can't stand the heat. Some of them, like me, just totally hate winter. Some of you who could resonate to our plants here is when you look at insects like cockroaches, you start the screaming, yelling, well, plants don't necessarily like them, except maybe for bees, because it's kind of helpful in a way. Plants don't like bacteria because it stresses them, and many more reasons to be stressed about living as a plant. Well, it's a hard life as a plant, actually. But before I proceed any further, I would like to ask every one of you a question. And please raise your hands if you have seen it. How many of you actually have seen a stressful plant? A few of show of hands, that's great. Here, I'm going to tell you that you can actually sense a plant in distress. Just like how you can identify an anxious friend who's having a tight hand grip, a nail-biting behaviour, as well as cold sweats. I would like to introduce you to my friend here, Arabidopsis. Arabidopsis is a close cousin to some of the plants or crops that you are familiar with. Canola, cabbages, but a miniature version. So my friend here obviously isn't too happy because the way I've been growing it. It's complaining, yes, I'm observing and I'm listening, but I'll show it to you what it's saying. So the few red circles here that I've shown to you are signs that my friend here is really stressed out. So you do see wilted leaves, crinkled leaves, not so happy looking, some bruises. Those are signs that the plant is stressed. It's fascinating, isn't it, to be able to see plants get stressed like us do. Remember the food security issue that I mentioned earlier in my talk? This is why listening to plant cell whispers matters. But I have a good news for you. We can actually capture the message before it's too late. And that's what myself, my lab, and other plant epigeneticists around the world are doing. We are trying to decipher the code, focusing more on the punctuations or RNA modifications itself to correctly understand what these messages actually mean, but more importantly, at crucial times where plants are experiencing stress due to, due to the changes of the environment. So these two are actually what I've been mentioning earlier, the sentences and the mailman, mRNA and tRNA. Punctuations exist on them, and in our lab, we look at one of these punctuations known as 5-methylcysteine, or in short, M5C. 
you might be asking, can we actually see the effect when plant cells aren't communicating correctly? An example that I'm showing here is one of the findings from our lab members that demonstrates such consequences. And yes, you can definitely see them. When you lost the punctuation M5C on sentences or even the, or even the mailman, you do notice that these plants who can't communicate or express the messages correctly do get shorter routes compared to their wild-type counterparts who can communicate accurately of what's happening around them. You might think this is something that's specific to the lab, but not really. In the field itself, we do notice that plants do have different growth rates, shorter routes when they're experiencing changes in the environment. And our research currently has narrowed it down to that it has actually something to do with the punctuations on sentences and the messenger itself. And there are many more modifications to explore apart from 5-methylcysteine. And that's what my PhD is currently about. So I've taken up this interesting finding from my lab and further expanding it by looking into other modifications. And there are just so many of them for me to explore. And I'm thinking, well, there must be somewhere I can start. In order to do so, I utilize molecular techniques to actually extract these sentences out in the process of keeping the punctuations on the sentences as much as possible, as the integrity of the messages means a lot to us. We then sequence these messages using cutting edge sequencing technology. Of course, we've now got the messages and the punctuations, but not, not necessarily we understood them. So a translation process has to happen into a version that we as humans or researchers can actually understand. We then translate these messages with the help of high-performance supercomputing, then try to decipher what they are actually saying, especially in conditions like changing environments or stress. And now we are at the final stop of the journey, looking at time and plants, and how the plants are actually racing against time. In the earlier talks, Gloria actually beautifully described the concept of time. But plants do have their own concept of time as well. And that's what the next story is about. In my PhD, I was fortunate enough to work with a group of talented scientists, and we discovered a time stone. You might think this is just too real to be true. A time stone? But the fact is, the identity of the time stone in plants is actually a protein that writes. Yes, you hear it correctly, a protein that writes. Nothing else but two punctuations. One methylguanosine, M1G, that's the first punctuation. One methylinosine, that's the second punctuation. So what happens if you remove the writer from the system? By losing the time stone, we lose these two punctuations on the messages, especially the mailman itself. And what happens that is there is a miscoordination of messages getting across, and that affects the time zone in plants. The time, the time zone changes causes the plants to actually grow slower, flower slower, and time eventually slows down in plants. Well, you might be thinking, it's not too bad for plants to be laid back just a little, to take their own sweet time to do things. They're still growing, right? But if the time in the plants itself is not matching up to what's happening in their environment, climate change, the unpredictable weather, are they going to survive? But our research shows that the changes of time in plants could be also related to these punctuations on the messages and the mailman. And hence, we now know that how crucial it is for us to understand that these are the cues that something's not right. And the plants are actually trying their best to actually race against time so that they could keep up with the environmental changes. At this point, it's really interesting to hear so much about RNA modifications on messenger RNAs and tRNAs. The sentences, the punctuations, and how similar plant cells do actually have to our system. 
But one thing hits me hard during my PhD. We have to embrace change, and the possibility is limitless. But to actually be prepared for this limitless change, we have to be ready for both the best and the worst. But I'm going to ask you a question. How can we be sure that we are absolutely ready when we know so little about our plants? To help put this into perspective, these are the complete structure of how the modifications actually look like. And there are a total of 150 of them. And out of the 150, of the past decades, we have only managed to thoroughly study the four or five of them to actually understand what they mean when it's put into a message context. Statistical-wise, there's less than 2.5%. And there's much more work to do for us as scientists and for you as the public to have the awareness that there's a lot of basic science going in understanding what's happening around us. To end my talk, this is what I've envisioned our future would be. But to do this, we have a long journey to go, but it's not impossible. As a takeaway message, have a think about this. If there's so much possibility that we can have in terms of molecular toolkits by understanding this 2.5%, imagine what we can do if we understand the 100%. Thank you.